Penauda, good afternoon. Hello, in a light three, doing handle team of Margada. I'm in a light and part of the good practice team of the Wales Audit Office. Can I welcome you to the uh, webinar on how understanding adverse childhood experiences can help integrated service delivery? So there are hundreds of you out there today, and I mean hundreds. We think it's between 350 and 400. So who are you? I'm just going to give you a bit of a flavour so we just have an understanding because I've never had such a wide uh, delegate profile ever uh, before. So in terms of different sectors, we've got local government, health, police, fire, third sector, voluntary sector, regulatory bodies, Natural Resources Wales, post-16 funding councils and colleges, housing associations, voluntary bodies, charities, Welsh Government, DWP, how about the roles though? Oh, I've never seen so many roles, different type of roles. So in health, we've got everyone from clinicians, we've got play leaders, we've got head of strategic partnership, we've got a range of different managers, we've got practice managers, we've got policy officers, we've got head of supported housing, we've got board members, we've got chief execs of voluntary bodies, student welfare officers, mentors, Consultant pediatricians, I then if I just click over here again, head of service, uh, head of services in charities, safeguarding leads, monitoring officers, and that is just an example of a few of you. What I will do is I'm going to introduce you to our team behind the camera now. So we've got Michelle, Gitto and Sarah. Pnaldaichi, afternoon. No, no. You'll see I'll be talking to them quite often doing asking them to share stuff with you. So um, did you know? you're the fourth member of the panel. In other words, let's hear what you've got to say and any observations that the panels are sharing, and I'll tell you how to get there. There's two ways of sending us observations or questions. They are good.practice at audit.wales, and the other one, I have to make sure I just check on the list I'm gonna get this one right. It's via Twitter, so I'm just checking I've got this right. The hashtag is WAO underscore ACES, A-C-E, which are capitals S. So I'll repeat the way you can send questions, observations in. It's good.practice at audit.wales. Or if you're on Twitter, it's WAO underscore ACES, capital A C E S. So that's the way of getting in touch with us. Don't wait to send your questions and observations in. Please send them in as soon as possible, and, and, I, and I'll get them on my iPad. So, in terms of the format for today, I'm going to introduce the panel for you in a minute, and then I'll talk you through the format of what to expect in the course of the webinar, if that's okay. So, Jeff, without further ado, can I ask you to introduce yourself to the delegates, if that's okay? Well, by all means, Ina. Um, I think a lot of people out there would know me. Um, my name is Jeff Farrer. I was formerly the Chief Constable of uh, Gwent Police up until July this year. Um, I'm now Chair of the Health Board in Bristol, University Health Board. Um, and I was formerly the chair of the Effective Services Group of Welsh Government, which br brings together key public services in Wales to look at new and emerging issues and also to look at existing issues for how we deal with our most vulnerable people. Um, during my time in Gwent Police, uh, I was uh, started the setup with Mr. Children's Project, which is around breaking the cycle and getting in early to understand the causes, not just the symptoms that we're presenting all the time. And we've had some great success with that, and hopefully. I'll be able to talk about some of that today. Jeff, thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, sorry, it's afternoon now. Hi, Alison. <laughs> uh, I'm Alison Francis, and I'm heading up the Ace Support Hub. The Ace Support Hub has been set up by a voluntary collaboration of organisations to uh, think about the impact of ACEs in Wales and um, champion and challenge uh, for change. Thank you, Alison. You're very welcome. Thank you. Charlotte, you're married to me. And uh, in a, um, I'm Charlotte Waite and I'm at the ACES Hub as the Housing Relationship Lead and uh, I'm previously a social worker so I've got experience working in children's services, homelessness, substance misuse um, and then I led a social work programme for a couple of years at the University of South Wales and then I came into housing, social housing and um, created some trauma-informed services for looked after children and homeless young people. So that's what I'm here today. Closer can I speak to you? Yeah. Unfortunately, Sophie Howe, for, um, the Commissioner for the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, is unable to be here this morning. She sends her apologies. What we're hoping to do is that we we'll catch up with Sophie and get her to share her observations. So we we'll possibly have two kind of webinars to share with you. This one and then um, Sophie's observations, if that's okay. 
So what can you expect over the next 90 minutes? So normally in, in a webinar, some of you I, I recognize from the list of delegates will have been used to me asking a couple of questions to the panel and you getting your questions and observations in. What we thought we'd do in terms of um, adverse childhood experiences, we understand a number of people are at different levels of understanding. So we thought we'd set a scenario and, uh, and it's around a, a, a young lady by the name of Sean and we talk through the stages of her life. So um, without further ado, um, and before we kick off with those scenarios, I'm going to turn to you, if I, if I, if I, if I may ask them, <laughs> why the webinar? Just why the interest? Why adverse childhood experiences? What is it that everyone's getting so excited about? Well, I think your intro said a lot, really, you know, with the breadth of interest and the different types of roles people have across multiple different sectors um, in Wales. I think ACEs, people that have got a sense of what it's saying, mm -hmm. and they can see connections in their everyday work mm -hmm. to uh, which reach out to the research. It's common language, yeah. um, something we don't often have across different professional groups. Yeah. So we're all talking about yeah. the same thing. I think, you know, in my experience, that's unique. I also think we've got the Wellbeing of Future Generations mm -hmm. Act, um, which is providing a massive stimulus to us to think about um, how we can improve lives for people in Wales, um, improve well-being. ACEs fit squarely in the centre of that. Yes, potential is massive. I think um, we're here today to start thinking about how we help support people, mm -hmm. answer some of those questions. <coughs> there is no tick box or one size fits all in this. Um, you know, I think we've got plenty of ideas, plenty of examples. What's really important to me that we should never forget is we've got fantastic building blocks here in Wales and we need to think about how we can make best use of them. We can talk today about things we know that are happening locally. Okay. We can also talk about some new national emerging work and plans to share that with people. Um, this webinar is a chance to hear lots of voices, as you've said, um, a range from across yeah. um, our breadth of experience, sure. but as you said, uh, we've got the fourth panel member out there in the audience. Um, and this is really a chance to uh, help people inform their plans, their work, their objectives, okay. think about what it means for them That's and brilliant. how they're going to create a nice informed Wales. Thank you very much. And lead your way internationally. Yeah. Let's I have know. aspiration. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, same hi. Um, I've just had a quick message in. Yes, I will share the um, delegate list with everybody. Um, Sarah, can you make a note that we just send all the delegate list out to everybody so you can see? Because in one organisation, there's 19 people listening in from one organisation, but they're right across the whole of the organisation. So maybe it might be a good chance for you to be made aware of who is doing what in your own organisation in relation to ACEs. So yeah, so that's made, made a note of that, if that's okay. So without further ado, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to read out the first scenario, then I'm going to ask the panel members to give, share their observations. I have had a couple of questions in already from delegates who can't listen in live, but I've asked me to pose the questions during uh, uh, after certain scenarios. So, but just to remind you, if you've got any questions or any observations as you're hearing the panel members uh, sharing their observations, or there might be something quite different that you might want to share or see clarity on, just to remind you, it's good dot practice at audit dot Wales, and the hashtag on Twitter is. Um, WAO underscore ACES, which are capital A C E, lowercase s. And I've just been reminded by Michelle that as some of you, if you've got a Google account, there's a little chat box on the YouTube. So um, we're also monitoring that. My colleague Bethan, Bethan Smith, is monitoring that for us as well. So if you're, she may well pick up some stuff on there. So, panel, are you ready? <laughs> okay. So. We're talking about Sean, who is three years old. Sean lives with her mum, Joe, and dad, Matthew. Her mum, Joe, often gets angry, sad, and withdrawn. Joe has had help from a GP and prescribed medication for depression. This affects how she cares for Sean. Joe doesn't like how her medication makes her feel and often forgets to take it. Sean loves spending time with her dad, and he's a go to person for care, fun, and learning. Joe and Matthew are having a baby boy when Sean is about three and a half. Their relationship breaks down. Matthew and Joe often argue and fight. Matthew's alcohol use increases and spends more time out of their family home and they eventually separate. 
Jill struggles to be a parent and care for two children. Jeff, I'm sure that's a story you've heard a lot and many times during the course of your career. What would your observations be on that? Well, I think uh, you know this is very typical, isn't it, across uh, Welsh public services, Welsh pub, Welsh life, and you know, as services. At what point do we engage and intervene? Uh, I think that's the challenge. Um, the reality of it is, until we understand what the collective demand looks like across our public services, it's very difficult because we look at these things in silos. So um, the father might be presenting with his alcohol problems for the police. The child might be presenting issues in school. Men might be presenting issues across social care or through health, but are we joined up in that conversation? And invariably we are, so I think that's a big challenge for okay. us. Yeah, okay, thanks for that. Thanks for giving that. So from a leadership point of view, you know, your uh, your last role in public services in Wales was as a leader of Gwent Police. So what would you be saying for those who are um, listening in? Because in many ways, many of the people listening in today are the converted, if you like, to a certain extent, hence the reason why they're listening in. But well, if they have leaders who are not converted, what would you be saying to them? Well, it's a, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because um, I would hazard a guess that the vast majority of people listening in today join public services to help people. Um, if you wanted to earn <clears> lots of money, you wouldn't be in public services. So we're in public services to help our most vulnerable people who, who are the ones that need the greatest help. Um, but yet the system drives us into protecting ourselves. So media comment, politicians, it could be the auditor, it could be the inspectorate, it could be a number of people who come in and drive us through policy, which means that we end up just following the rules rather than doing the right thing. And that's not why we join public services, but that's where we end up. And it takes some brave leadership to step away and say, no, I'm going to do something differently. Um, and my, my experience is, yes, when you come to the top of an organisation, that becomes a bit easier. It's still difficult because you get a lot of challenges, but it, but it becomes a bit easier. The challenge for, I guess, most people is you're not going to convince senior leaders. I think you have to start small, prove things work, yeah. scale them up, and then that proves it to, to the people around you. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for that. Alison, can I come to you? Yeah, I think um, there's so much in this scenario, but what we do know from what evidence tells us is the importance of the early years. Um, we know that there are a number of um, uh, local authority areas across Wales which are starting to very much focus on the early years under the auspices of the first 1000 days collaborative program mm -hmm. uh, which is another program of work of Cumbria Wales um, looking at how we looking at early years from the parents point of view and the child's point of view uh, what are our opportunities for system change how do we focus in our attention uh, to those vital years, which when we start to think about the life course spaces mm -hmm. are a really important time. Uh, one of the other things that jumped out at me um, in this scenario, when we start to think about the five ways of working under the Wellbeing Act, is that of involvement um, and the role of the father's voice in yeah. particular, yeah. and how we are involving fathers um, in our systems, particularly in the early years, which seem to be very focused towards mothers. Okay. But we know from um, uh, from the work we've done around ACEs and building resilience and protective factors that a stable, caring adult relationship is very important. And that doesn't always have to be a mother. There are other people that can play that, that role. And I think, you know, that's an important thing to think about. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Um, I know that a number of you from early years listening in this morning and, and, and what's your thoughts about this? Would you like to care to share it for us? One of the things I forgot to say about the very beginning was that when you send your questions in, I guarantee your anonymity. I have trouble with that word. Um, so send your question in. If you're thinking it, or if you're making, if you have an observation to make, there's a fair chance of quite a few of you also out there. So be brave. Start sending the questions in, and then we'll share them um, un un anonymized. Oh, I stopped with that word. So Charlotte, can I come to you on that one? I'll get my master that word one of these days. So right, yeah. okay. I sort of wanted to echo what Alison said about the Think Family part of this. That actually, um, it. Uh, there's, I'm sure there are really good GPs doing this already. Mm -hmm. So an ACE aware GP would be asking who else is in the home and what are the assets in that home. Um, and a good health visitor would also be having that conversation about the impact of Joe's uh, mental well-being 
on her family and what are the assets in that community. And ASA were community, so friends, neighbours, everybody would be talking to Jo about how she's feeling and how they can help her if, we, if this becomes our common language. And actually for me, this scenario is pre-public services apart from the health, visit, the health services that will be there okay. in the first 1,000 days. Really good examples across Wales where GPs, for example, referring to social prescribing in Torvine okay. would recognise Jo's vulnerability and actually if she could tap into community assets, things that would help her and the father absolutely mm -hmm. okay. um, support them in that, in okay. that way. Yeah. Ito, can we share that out, what's happening in Torvine? Sarah, can yeah. you pick that up if that's okay? <clears throat> so that's about what's happening in Torvine on the social yeah, prescribing. prescribing GPs and referring to social prescribing. Okay. And because it's you know non-prescribed, mm -hmm. non-medicalised, it's very community asset based. Okay. It's very different from uh, you know a list of services you can go and, you can go and, uh, or a directory of services. We know people don't access things in that way. Mm -hmm. What works is early intervention that's relational. So relation, early intervention doesn't mean doing the same things that we do upstream, downstream, okay. and referring to those same services only earlier. That's not what early intervention wow. is. I really want to stress yeah. that. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Because we'd like, we like to tweet that out. So um, early intervention is not doing um, upstream what you did downstream. Yeah, it's not doing downstream what you've got upstream. So it's not referring to the same services that are there anyway. Okay. I know some people across Wales are really grappling with, okay, we want an early intervention help, we want an early intervention intervention okay. but if you create interventions you create assessments okay. you create exactly. needs to so you create okay. access and thresholds into okay. services again this really is about doing things differently mm -hmm. and not the same thing but okay. Okay. and i think if you fast forward um you know 10 however many years into um what a vision for ACES could look like i think you you would be at the point where you wouldn't even be asking some of this question yeah. because um people would recognizing themselves that they might need some help yeah. uh, they would know where to go where to approach so so some of the things that Charlotte's just described just would you know you wouldn't yeah. need them so I think some of this is about trying to shift outside our current way that we work and start to think about where could we be if we start to look that much further ahead okay Alison, I've got some messages come through from Twitter thank you very much so first questions to you Alison if I may um, I'm aware of a number of pieces of work happening locally and nationally. Uh, this person is ACES aware. Mm -hmm. So what are the plans to pull these together? Well, funnily yes. enough, we, <laughs> we were talking about this earlier on yeah. um, this afternoon, uh, this afternoon, this morning, yeah. um, around um, <coughs> uh, some of the um, channels for communication. Um, so we, at the moment, we've got, uh, within the A-Support Hub, a uh, uh, Twitter account, mm -hmm. um, A-Support Hub Wales. Uh, we've got a Facebook page, which is really brand new, uh, uh, A Support Hub Cymru. What people have been asking us for, which we're looking at next, is how we build a website of resources. Okay. Uh, we're starting, we've got a big event coming up in North Wales next week. Okay. For that, we're pulling together a whole pack of where people can go for more information, okay. um, more reading around the subject, understanding what's going on. Okay. Um, there's so much out there when you start looking. Yes. I think some of it is taking a, uh, taking a view on um, uh, on, on what how sort of solid the evidence is. Okay. But some of this is new for all of us. Okay. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a blend of the both. Okay. But um, if you keep watching our Twitter handle and our Facebook site as okay. a website and other resources develop, okay. um, we'll be using those to communicate okay. out. We'll tweet out the event that's happening next week as well. And um, it's next week in North Wales, yeah? Yeah. Okay. There's so, a huge waiting list though. Oh, so is it? are on the list. Okay. Get on the waiting <coughs> list because we might need to do another one. Lovely, we'll do that with pleasure. We'll tweet that out and we'll also tweet out your handle and your Facebook page, okay? Jeff, there's a question coming in for you. Okay, um, sorry, I'll, it's quite a lengthy question, so I'll, I'll repeat it twice. So, um, extraordinary progress has come not from individuals acting alone, but from people collaborating in organisations. Yet, the current way we run organisations has been stretched to the limits. Could it be that our current worldview limits the way we think? how we act, and what needs to change. Now, I'll give you time to have a think, so I'll repeat it again for you. So extraordinary progress has, made, has come not from individuals acting alone, but from people collaborating in organisations. Yet, the current way we run organisations has been stretched to the limits. Could it be that our current worldview limits the way we think, how we act, and what needs to change? 
Well, I think, first of all, we can't just stop doing the things that we do. So um, we're presented with crisis and our services are often geared up to deal with the here and now in those crises. So we can't just stop doing those things. But actually, we all know that that doesn't work. It doesn't break the cycle. It doesn't stop the demand. It, and we get an insatiable increase in demand. So people expect more. We've got diminishing resources. Um, but the stated strategic assent, uh, intent for the whole of Wales across the Future Generations Act and um, prosperity for all for Welsh Government is very, very clear about the approach that we should be taking. I think the biggest challenge is um, how do we collectively understand the demand, first of all? Do we, do we know uh, what we're actually facing? And then secondly, our systems are geared up in a way that accountability doesn't encourage us to share across public services. It drives us into our own performance uh, cultures and invariably, as much as we might talk about the right things to do, we get driven into a way of working, whether it be by the media or the inspector or uh, even in our own internal functions. And, um, you know, like I said before, nobody joins public services to think about themselves before the public. But that's what we end up with because our systems drive that. And I think the biggest challenge for us is, is to do things in tandem, so start the work upstream. Um, I absolutely agree with the comment, which is, you know, we shouldn't be designing things um, which are another intervention similar to the way we do yeah. downstream and, and that's sometimes <coughs> what people are looking for but there has to be a little bit of a leap of faith in this and a lot of my conversations with uh, senior leaders have proved, proved to me this works well you know I'm not going to be able to prove that it works but intuitively I know it's going to work um, and I think the answer is in case study not in stats yeah. so talking about people's personal experiences brings this alive not in statistics and statistics can prove anything so i think we have to operate a different way okay. in our performance culture okay and i really think we've got an opportunity to do that in wales one around the act but two around our connectivity mm. politically and our relationships across public services great. that's unique thank you great answer there especially literally off the cuff um charlotte you're hitting some some notes here to this morning so um I'm, i've got se about seven questions come in i'm trying to very quickly sort of pull them together to sort of say it's all to do about um successful intervention um one question about the um, intervention do we know what the elements of a successful intervention looks like let me see what's coming through on twitter um so um families first across ways is developing an ace language outcomes and cost saving framework for example um, there's a couple of other points about um, social prescribing is vital and also intervention is not about the same uh, thing offering earlier yeah. but this going back to this one question I think this one question here comes is is probably the question I'd like you to answer do we know what the elements of a successful intervention looks like yeah well yes I would say it you know it has to be relational that is the basic it has to be relational for me, a lot of the, the ACES research, what it confirms for us in Wales, there's been a breakdown in community and a breakdown in the, the relationships that people have that enable them to build resilience. So anything that goes to that, which is relational. So that means think big, that means relationship with your organisation. So that means the values of your organisation and how you all conduct yourselves from a housing perspective, from the rent collector, <coughs> the, the um, maintenance man to the chief exec. So it means relational, not just with you on the phone that day or in face to face, but it means your whole organisation. And if people build relationships with organisations they then trust, that changes the way that they interact with public services across their life course and therefore the success that they might have from them. Um, what was it? What, what do we know the good element? What makes a good, what is good? Uh, yeah. I, was, I was lining up Alison's next question. Do we know what the elements of a successful yeah. intervention yeah. looks like? Yeah, so it's the bit intervention that is, if once you say intervention, it's, it's like you're suggesting service. So I suppose what I want to blow the lid off is this isn't always a service and we don't have to be precious about, mm -hmm. you know, leave early intervention to us. We've got it sorted with the early intervention service. This is about everybody collectively in the community too. And there's some really good 
research coming out of the Fulfilling Lives Programme in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So this was about street homeless people and no wrong door was their philosophy. There shouldn't have to be 12 services you go to. And something that they've shown to really work is people with lived experience offering support to other people who are homeless. Oh, yeah. so, that, so that proves to me yeah. my point about actually it's the community helping each other and people with these experiences helping each other. So that's not about services, that's not about intervention, mm -hmm. that's about giving everybody yeah. a language. Just give a name check to that study from Birmingham again so we can tweet it out. Yeah, it's the Fulfilling Lives Programme in Birmingham, big lottery funded project from okay. Birmingham. It does, I don't know. Okay, and on no wrong door, they've done something similar in Yorkshire and okay. an evaluation report. Yes. Okay, okay, yeah, we'll share that with you. We'll tweet it out now, but we also send it, we email these links to everyone following the event. Right, question for you now, Alison. Uh -huh. To a degree, we have an ability to upscale staff and services uh -huh. regarding ACEs, yeah. but how are we going to make communities communities ACE aware? Good question. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I'm just telling you if I've got another question coming through for you. Okay. You're obviously hitting the buttons on people this morning. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, it's afternoon. Alison. It's been a long day. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's a few things in that question. Um, you're right, there's a brilliant opportunity to upskill staff. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things we've been <coughs> thinking about within the ACE Support Hub. So uh, our colleague Kelly at the moment is working on a skills and knowledge framework uh, for people to get a better sense of what is it that I really need to know okay. in relation to my role? Uh, we're basing it on some work that they've been they've done in Scotland, okay. uh, which has gone down a storm with all the people we've shared it with okay. so far. Um, Let's give a bit of a name check to that work. A name check to that. So it's been developed by um, the uh, National Didn't Education it. Scotland. Didn't mean to put you in spot. We can, we can send the link out. It's trauma informed framework. If you Google it yeah, in okay. Scotland, it okay. just comes up. Okay, cool. Um, so we're using that as a basis. It talks very much about trauma, whereas in Wales we're talking very much about ACEs. Yeah. Um, but it, it's it's really comprehensive. It's really uh, relevant. It's based on a lot of research okay. and evidence, mm -hmm. and I think it provides us with that good opportunity of what do I need to know. Mm -hmm. um, what we're also doing is working with others and taking the opportunity to build uh, knowledge and information around ACEs into professional training. So thinking future generations, yeah. thinking sustainability, how does this become part of our, our, our learning, okay. um, depending on our professions, um, but also in schools too. Okay. Uh, so, so we're working on that. But in relation to communities, I think this is a really important point. Can I just hold you there on communities because I've got several questions coming afterwards. What do you mean by communities? So so there's a question yeah. being posed by some by one of the delegates out there. What do they when you're making reference to the term communities, what do you mean by communities? But it's also back to the person who sent the question in. What did you mean by communities? Because we want to make sure we're answering your question the, the way you wanted. So just tell me what do you mean by communities before you answer it so so the context can be there. I know, because is, is it a geographical one? Is it a group of people like, for instance, you know, sort of... Well, so, and this is the so. thing, it, might, it, it could be all of it. When I'm, in, in relation to this question, what I'm thinking of is general population. Okay. Um, okay. So, so in relation to our work, we are thinking about how do we bring uh, what we know about ACEs, what ACEs are, to the general population, and there may be some segments within the general population um, where this is of particular relevance and where we've already started doing some work. Okay. So for example, um, one group that um, we've had a lot of interaction with and a lot of questions from following the publication of the Wales study last year right. were foster carers and adoptive parents. Okay. Um, so um, at the moment what we're doing is starting some work with Participation Cymru to work with people in communities to start to test out how do we best talk about ACEs okay. in a way which is uh, non-stigmatizing, is supportive, is used in a language that people understand. Um, <coughs> you know, there might be a professional language, but there might be everyday to day parlance. We've seen some work in the States where actually they just talk about stress. Everybody yeah. gets stress. Um, <coughs> so, so, there's, so there's some beginning of some exploratory work about that. Um, it's in our plans to start communicating I was having a conversation with somebody from Comtarth yesterday um, and they are starting to think about how do they share this with community so we said let's work together on that mm -hmm. uh, we know there's a community group that are holding a session within a geographical community uh, in December where they're showing the resilience film which we've been showing around Wales and having a discussion amongst themselves mm -hmm. about 
what does this mean for us? Okay. Um, so okay. there's a couple of different things happening. Okay. But if people are interested in finding out a bit more about that, contact us directly. Okay. Okay. Where would you like them to contact you? What's the email address? They could, uh, we've got Twitter, Facebook, or we've got an email address. Uh, ace at wells.nhs.uk thank you very much thank you okay um jeff i'm trying to find your question okay there's a number of these questions on the same line but i choose this question to kind of um covers it it's probably the best one to choose for those services that are more enforcement based police welfare etc how can we embed aces informed work when the remit is not solving but addressing stroke mitigating crisis Great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I'm going to read it slowly to give you time to no, think. I've got it. I, got I, think, it. I think just just on that point about communities, that's giving me some thought. Just before I finish it, we did a huge amount of work around the digital community, mm -hmm. which was not in the locality. So increasingly, mm -hmm. I've got an issue. Mm -hmm. I Google it. Mm -hmm. I find a forum. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to people online, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's where I'm I'm having those conversations. But then it's your work community and your sporting community, and yeah. and so it's complex, isn't it? Yeah. You know, this is really complex. We have there's not an easy solution. Um, I think that one about enforcement is this isn't either or. We will still always have to enforce certain issues. That's points of crisis. That's downstream. That's the here and now. And that's why I'm saying, you know, that will never go away. There will always be elements of that. We're not going. It's not going to be a panacea for everything. But huge amounts of repeat demand that we're dealing with, we could easily solve. So an example I gave earlier was I, I bumped into um, somebody who'd been arrested every day in Cardiff City Centre by me and many others for years and years and years. He was alcoholic. He was homeless. He was a shoplifter, and he just got arrested constantly. Never once did I even think thirty years ago how could we try and break the the cycle because I was too busy. I was too busy doing things. Um, and yet, I think that conversation has started to take place more now. We're having it here in Wales. And the answer is exactly what has been said so far by Charlotte and by Alison, which is we've got to train people in a different way. We've got to think in a different way. And we've still got to do enforcement, but it shouldn't be the way we focus our thinking all the time. Okay. Can I say thank you to you folks out there? You're sending some great information in. What I'm going to do is, I'm, um, you're asking me, sort of, you're sharing some of the piloting work that you're doing. I'm going to share it with all the um, uh, panel here. And also, we'll email you directly back afterwards to ask you how you'd like us to share it afterwards, if that's okay. One final question coming through is to do with um, about this intervention. This word in early intervention is really okay. uh, getting to be a ch ch chime in. Yeah. So, they, they, they wanted your view on, on about early intervention. It's not the sort of shifting stuff upstream. No. no. I mean, I, I think, okay, it's not to say, I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is if a service has been set up to deal with a crisis, that isn't what's needed when you're, when you're spotting Joe coming to the GP with the beginnings of a mental health issue. Whereas what we are in danger of is knowing, oh, we've got this, we know this, we know how this goes we'll move that service up there and a bit like we talked about earlier the services will jump in and rescue this family um, and sometimes we put a lot of energy then into engaging families that are difficult to engage and in trying to get them uh, to get to services and sometimes what we know and i know this happens is oh you can see exactly what this family needs they're just not quite there yet on that threshold so we wait for families to deteriorate yeah. and get to the threshold so they get the service yeah. Yeah. so so this is about being brave and bold in your role, if it's your role, or if it's not your role, if it's your neighbour. This is, I, you know, if it's just your community. And, and that's what I love about the social prescribing model is it's non-stigmatising. It is a community asset-based um, vehicle that doesn't do intervention and service and help. I'm not saying that there are those families that might come to the GP with a more significant mental health issue than we've got in mm. this scenario and maybe Matthew also presenting at the drug and alcohol service and maybe that right okay so something more significant needs to happen for this family and then you might need a service but even then if you need a service it can't be the same service that's being delivered up here which will be time limit have its own KPI outcome focused mm. silo working into because I'm a mental health or I'm a substance misuse service I'm going to work with you on your substance misuse I know we all 
try our best to work differently, work holistically. But really, I know that there isn't enough whole family working going on. I'm not talking about families first. I know they do that. But there are other adult <coughs> focus based services that are not doing whole family working and that could be. So there are ways that we can change the models if you are going to do early intervention for those that are pre-threshold that actually needs something more significant okay. that can be more creative and relational and trauma-informed yes. yes oh you must yeah. forget that yeah. great answer thank you mm -hmm. last question before we move on to, to um mm -hmm. i'm aware you're sending some great questions in if you see what i'm doing i'm i'm trying to choose one question that's sort of representing a number of one and there's, there's this question about children's first i'm going to choose this question if i may how are you joining up the community ace conversation with children's first mm. can i ask you to share yeah. that you can ask that question um and i think uh, early days uh so we were involved uh earlier this year at the launch of children first mm -hmm. um going there to talk to um some of the pioneer areas and others to offer our support um, we've had a couple of contacts since then of um one or two children first pilot areas okay. and one or two that aren't okay uh, but who would actually like to do something okay. different um children first areas that i've spoken to are starting to think about all right what does this mean for us okay. um so it's a, a bit of organicness at the moment okay. and, and early days okay. but um the conversations have started okay. which i think is important to know I'm hearing the word relational quite often this morning, so I'm going to check that question back at you folks. There are dozens of people who are from the sort of children's first um, community out there listening in now. What would you like? Come and tell us, share with us, email us at good.practice at audit.wales and I will share it with Alison um, so just to hear that conversation. Okay. Or if you're on Twitter, it is, I've got to check this, um, hashtag WAO underscore aces a c e capital and then a lowercase s okay right panel great first part of that great scenario one i'm going to get you now to move forward on i'm going to move sean from age three to age seven so sean is age seven she now lives with a mum joe and mum joe's new partner john sean's left wales where her family lived um, to live with John. So Sean now attends school regularly and has good routine at home. However, Sean has difficulty maintaining friends and she's moving quite a lot. Jo struggles to manage depression and has nobody to turn to as they keep moving frequently. So Jo and John separate when Sean is 10 years old and they return to Wales. Sean is struggling to settle in school and her attendance is affected. Sean and her mother are arguing. Joe is in a new relationship with Simon and he moves in with them. There are daily arguments. Sean is angry towards her mother. Simon is violent towards Joe and Sean often tries sorry. Simon is violent towards Joe and Sean often tries to stop this. The police are frequently called to the home. Simon resents Sean and she is forced to spend time in the shed. Sean hates going home. She spends more time out of the home with friends. By the time Sean is, uh, is 13, she's run away from home and nobody came looking for her. She spent time on this, uh, she spent time sofa surfing and sleeping indoors with friends before eventually returning home for short periods. By the age of 16, Sean has been placed in a bed and breakfast by housing. Oh, I felt quite. Uh, reading that, just reading that, it mm -hmm. just brings it to life, the reality of it. Jeff, can I come to you first on this one, if that's all right? Give me a perspective from a leadership point of view. What what would you say to that scenario? What would your observations be? Well, I think, first of all, we are still predominantly geared up in silos. So within this now, there's multiple people. They're a family. Um, yet there's a danger that we start looking at them as individuals and deal with them in, in not as a collective in individual ways and that's a, that's a, a big problem so <clears throat> here first of all even before we get to this stage when we start to get the early signs where is the collective assessment of the intelligence so we feed in this might be a problem with Sean this might be a problem with the mother this might be a problem for the father where is that conversation taking place and I don't think it is enough across public services it, this isn't about redesigning the way we deliver our services. Some of our interventions are fine, but they work well. But what we're not doing is having that early conversation and say, no, I think actually Sean's okay, or 
we need to intervene now. And uh, some of the stuff on the Missing Children project in Gwent did exactly that. So we ended up with um, people going right way through the 16 and then chaotic drug users in the sex trade, horrendous failings really. Yet when we know those early signs are popping up, we can intervene and they can be very simple solutions. Some of the solutions are just getting them a friend in school yeah. and that might put them back on the right track. Mm -hmm. If we get to when they're 15 or 16, then it's huge amounts of public services. You know, we, we looked at this across public services yeah. and one young girl, and this is, this is dreadful failings of the system really, in nine months she'd gone missing over a hundred times and it cost the public purse over a hundred thousand pounds. If we'd given a 24 hour care and put in a four star hotel, we'd save money. Now, now, she's not isolated. <coughs> that happens time and time and time again because we look at things in silos. And I think the key here is that collective conversation. And I think one of the biggest problems with it is that we don't know enough about what each other do. We think we do, okay. but we just don't. And I think there needs to be more cross fertilization across services in, in, in Wales. Okay. Uh, I think we've got an opportunity to do that. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Thanks for those initial Thank you, John. Can I come to you, Alison? Yeah, um, and I think that part, the last point that Jeff made, I think, is a really an important one, and, and one that we're well placed to work on now. Okay. Um, I think um, with a lot of the drivers that we've got here. Um, in relation to this scenario, uh, there were a couple of things that jumped out to me. One of them, of course, we know that um, transition points can be very traumatic uh, for people and can often traumatise people um, that are already in a state of. Um, heightened stress um if you listen to that scenario you know you could tick off mm. ace after ace after ace when you start to think about um sean um if you fast forward a little bit uh in terms of what we've been talking about today um services will know about aces and be able to spot some potential risks mm -hmm. we're doing some work in schools at the moment um around how we equip people within schools to start to understand the signs. We know the impact of multiple ACEs or the risk multiple ACEs can have on development um, and how over the life course that can impact on behavioural development and some of the signs in that scenario are early warning signs really that maybe something is not quite right there yeah. and our opportunities to uh, look at what, what we do earlier on. Um, also I think important in schools is that Sean feels she's got somebody she can trust somebody she could talk to. I think schools have got a vital role in when we start to think about that trusted adult. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, as you were talking about Sean's sort of ongoing reaction yeah. to, to what she's experiencing, um, how she's becoming involved with others that are not necessarily supporting <coughs> her in a safe uh, way. So where there are no alternatives for somebody to feel involved and connected, which we know is a protective factor, uh, we could see people um, uh, driving in, in other directions, um, you know, uh, and when we start to think about, I think Charlotte touched on it earlier, that really important point about why do we wait for people to reach a crisis? Yeah. I mean, mm. it's just crazy to me, and you know, you talked about the costs involved in that, but there's actually that, you know, the impact on the person, um, and so it's that where services, and the example here, we've got the police are doing the repeated visits, you know, what is their role? Um, this is important, you know, they are um, they're not necessarily trained to deal in vulnerability, but we know that that's what they do. There's a great example of work that's been happening in Bridgend to start to, to develop some uh, awareness for police, uh, which had a really great uh, reaction to that and evaluations just been published. So okay. we can share that. Shall we give a name check for that um, to share? So what was the name of the evaluation? Project? So it's the uh, Policing Vulnerability Early Intervention and okay. Prevention okay. Uh, Project, which is due to come to an end. Uh, in March and be replaced by a much uh, bigger okay. program of work. Can we get that up front so we can try and share that? That'd be great. Thank so, um, but, but that's what <coughs> we've been doing, okay. looking at what is their role so they're not going back out to the same families generation after okay. generation. Just that you know, folks, we already got getting questions coming in about a county sharing of data and, oh, yeah. and, and so I'm just giving you the heads up about that one. So, any other questions? We've got questions coming in about data. Um, cross border working out of county mm -hmm. stuff coming already mm -hmm. coming in. So, um, just any more just bring them in so the quest to send your questions or observations good dot practice at audio dot wales what's your thoughts on well this? i feel like i um really identify with this young person yeah from my work experience mm -hmm. yeah 
Um, but I, I suppose the point for me was about pre-threshold services again okay. and energy not going into the threshold and recognising that actually the outcome for young people once they reach threshold is not good anyway. I'm sorry, that's just how it is in Wales. Outcomes for looked after children just aren't good. So that we shouldn't be pushing towards needing that threshold to get the service. I know I'm preaching the converted. I, I you know, champion everything that's been said here. So I just want to come in from a housing perspective, really, because for a family that moves a lot, there's an absolute opportunity for local authority housing staff and landlords to be the agency that spots the ACEs and has the conversation. That's a very non-stigmatising relationship, or can be. It can be a very helpful relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not a child protection relationship. Why not maximise that, recognise the ACEs and have the conversation? That can only happen if there's brave leadership, if there's, if there's permission to step outside of your job role and spend more time with that family, tap into the community networks and build that relationship. Um, oh, there's another key point, sorry. That my, take your time. My, son's, my son's iPad is um, crumbled <laughs> on me. Don't worry, <laughs> take your time. Um, <laughs> coming, coming, coming. Take your time, no rush. Um, I've got a question. Oh, I know. I know what it is. It's about B and B, because okay. I just want to say it's not okay. There should be no young person in Wales in B and B. And I know loads of local authorities have worked really hard to eradicate that, following the work that happened here last year around the young person's pathway. So each local authority now has a young person's pathway specifically designed to eradicate the use of B and B. Now I know some young people are still having to go to B and B because the supported accommodation provision for young people, young care leaders or just young, vulnerable young people isn't there as it should be. I could rant all about this for ages. Just to say, if it is there, it needs to be psychologically informed, it needs to be trauma-informed, it needs to be absolutely well linked with the local PCSOs and police data and working. And I also want to say about family intervention here. So there's some great projects. So Solace in Newport run a great family intervention project, preventing homelessness where um, there's a risk of homelessness where there's young, vulnerable people. Again, an example of brave commissioning or brave organisations saying okay we're going to do the work that nobody else wants to do this yes. is pre-threshold they get by on a pittance why it doesn't work is because and we talked about this earlier there is a little bit of professional snobbery of like actually if we just get this child looked after it'll go to social services and they will prescribe what's needed for this family actually housing what do you really know about child protection well actually what we know a lot about is antisocial behavior in communities and how to keep people paying their rent and keeping their homes and keeping children at home right well, over sorry no no, no. <laughs> wow how do you i like that term professional snobbery Wow, okay. Um, Jeff, we've got questions coming through about domestic violence and how this information has been shared out of county and stuff. Sort of from Gwent, there's been some great stuff done on domestic violence, hasn't there? Well, there's, there's been <coughs> lots of examples across Wales mm -hmm. where sharing of data and intelligence works really effectively. And we've got really hung up over years about sharing of, of uh, data. Um, and I understand why. Again, this comes back to the accountability structure. People fearful of if they share information, what's going to happen to them? But actually we know, don't we, it's right to share it if it's in the needs of vulnerable people. And, uh, it, you know, th there can't be an, an answer for that. But this is happening. You know, we are doing this. You know, the key has to be to bring people together to have the conversations. We, we've signed so many agreements and protocols around information sharing. But the key is not the, 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 the protocols and the information sharing uh, policies. It's about getting people in the room and have a conversation and saying, what do we know about Sean? There's a conversation across the table. It's not one that's built around strategy meetings in the formal way. We have an informed conversation and we make some decisions about what service we're going to try and provide. Can I come up with a lovely example of what's okay? Yeah. South Wales Police are sharing information with social landlords okay. about where the most of their police call-outs are happening. So providing that intelligence is so, in terms of prevention, so landlords are now having information that they didn't know about things were happening in their homes <coughs> to be able to yeah. offer support earlier. Okay. So, yeah. So, is that RSLs or is that private landlords? RSLs. RSLs. Yeah. And yeah. You know, the rules changed around information and intelligence. Okay. When I joined the police service in the early 80s, we, and the same with health service and same with social care, we had the information. Nobody else had it. We didn't share it. We didn't give it to you. Now, you can find out more by going on the internet than, than actually we hold in our systems. Wow. Um, so, if I want to find <clears> out about you, I can interrogate that, that open source information. Yeah. And find out more about you on there than I could find out from public services. 
the world is changing. Okay. So that availability of information okay. intelligence, and the public aren't asked, they're doing the same thing. <laughs> so they, they're informed in a yeah. very different way, and yeah. so we've actually got to start working in a different way. We're starting to. There, it, it, there's green shoots. It, we shouldn't be negative about yeah. this. We've, but we've got a real opportunity in Wales because we're connected, we're small enough, we're politically connected. Um, you know, we, we should be more ambitious than perhaps we are at the moment. Okay. Based upon, you've been on about Yeah, yourself, and the point of data is a really uh, important one, I think. And we, you know, I was on a conversation with somebody the other day about um, some of the wellbeing assessments and what's not mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often what's not reflected are some of the some of the stats around yeah. domestic yeah. violence and stats around yeah. abducted children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we saw a great example building on what Charlotte was talking about on a research trip to the States earlier this year where effectively what was a public service board were looking at all of the data from the different partners, laying it up, being really clear on where the hot spots were for them to focus on resources and think about what is it this community is saying to us, what, what is this community needing, a, a geographical community, yeah. um, and what are we going to do about it. Yeah. Um, so there is power in information sharing, and I think we've got some really good examples where it's worked. Gwen, um, Jeff mentioned earlier on uh, the Missing Children Hub. Yes, I visited that uh, a week or so ago, and uh, they were talking about some of the challenges around it. There's lots of myths in some of this space. Yes. 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 Um, and Actually, we give a name check to that because Carrie and her team presented at one of our shared learning seminars. So can we send the link out to the Missing Children's Project in Gwent from one of our um, shared learning seminars we had about a year and a half ago? And we can send that link out if that's okay. Um, some questions coming in, folks, so I, I need to sort of, there's lots of examples of referrals from schools who spot that their pupil, pupils need extra help. This is working well. Great. There's that one coming through there, and then there's a um, question here. It's, it's a Charlotte and Alison question. How can we use this platform to encourage social services to invest more money in preventing rather than crisis? Great question. <laughs> Do I'm they sorry. have any money to invest? I think it might be. There. It's about how you use your money in some ways, isn't it? But sort of, yeah. I would say that, wouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's an intro. That, that, yeah. you know. The number of that is in the question, isn't yeah. it? You know, and it's a conversation we've been having around um, thinking outside the. Yeah, yeah, we've touched on it all today in the answer to our questions. The bound, what are the boundaries yeah. of your role? And it's, I suppose, a bit like Charlotte's professional snobbery, a bit yeah. of our why wait to people reach crisis point before we intervene. You know, we sort of um, put people in their silos of this is what their job is all about. Yeah. Um, the, there was somebody I heard some months ago said, you know, talk about disrespecting boundaries, but there's something around, um, and, and it comes up a bit later in the scenario, I think, the role of social services for earlier intervention, you know, yeah. a, a, and shifting thinking a bit further up, upstream rather than the why do we need to pump more money into something? We need the whole picture looking differently. To avoid some of that happening okay. and that's what some of this stuff is telling us so, okay brave collaborative commissioning would be a great start okay so just like it's happened in the private sector or in the third sector where commissioners will only commission consortiums why okay. are we not thinking in that way oh, that we okay. actually you bring a lot of expertise to that then so you bring some early health <coughs> expertise along with the, the threshold expertise i'm not saying we don't need that i'm not saying we don't need cams we don't need specialists of course we do but they can have a much better chance to do their job if actually what, what arrives there is the people who really need that service early doors. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, the other, just one point on that one. Yeah. You know, senior leaders have to challenge the blame culture. Okay. Um, because that's what that's about, is is the blame culture. And um, there's an interesting book by Matthew Syed um, yeah. called Black Box Thinking, yeah. where he talks about, now, and he presented that to Chief Constable's Council when I was there, and he had violent agreement from the room. Um, but I started to write down those people who individually uh, or organisations hold, would hold me to account as a chief constable, and I got 50 and stopped writing. Yeah. Wow. Most of those could put me before a court. Right. So any wonder that to, to take that brave step yeah. to say I'm going to operate in a different way, when all of these people can and often do put me before a court, what, yeah. what's the incentive for me leading yeah. the organisation? Well, the incentive is the right thing to do, yeah. and that's why I'm in public services, and that's why I want to yeah. lead in the way I do. But trust me, it was quite a lonely place when I was doing it, yeah. um, and it, it, 
you know, you think it's easy for people at the top of the organization just to mandate this. Mm -hmm. It isn't because you've got all of those caveats to sit there. We, we need to unpeel all of those. Yeah. And we need to do that from the top of Welsh Government. And I, I do think Sophie's opportunity as the Future Generations Commissioner yeah. is a, a, should be a real bonus for us here in Wales. Thank you for that. I've got some questions, the same question to you both actually. Can I come to you first on it, Charlotte? Um, most ACs naturally trigger a safeguarding style of response and allow us to justify intervention as services. How do we effectively manage and support good parental separation and who can do this most effectively? Can I come to you first, Charlotte? Then can I come to you, Jeff, if that's okay? Okay. I think uh, parental separation has been a big uh, bone of contention in when we've gone around talking to people about ACEs. So how do we manage that well without stigmatising people is I think what's behind that question. Mm -hmm. So I think, because, mm -hmm. yeah, well, an ACE aware Society, sorry if that sounds naive and, naive and daft, daft. Uh, maybe I could talk personally. I'm a, I'm a separated parent, yeah. so I worry about the impact of the ACEs on my own children. How have I managed that well? So how do I build resilience in my <coughs> children? I, I tap into my networks. I be emotional literacy in children and adults. I'm sorry to be American about this, but this really is about talking about our feelings more and being much more open to that conversation without it being an assessment form that needs to trigger a service. So if we all have the ACEs conversation with each other, we're all much more. So if children in schools, but not just in schools, at homes, in clubs, on the buses, are understanding what happens in their brains when they feel stressed and where they're sort of finding a language for that. And if parents are able to talk to their children about that too, then that's how we build resilience. It's about, it's about understanding the importance of a consistent adult in a child's life. Because if you can't be that consistent adult, who can you bring in to be that? Who could you tap in for your child to be that? Is that helpful? I don't know. That's what well, let's ask. Yeah. Do you want to come back to Charlotte on that? Is there anything else you wanted to share on that one? Thank you. Jeff, can I come to you on this one? Yeah. Okay. yeah. You know, I think it touched on what I talked about earlier, which is the collective assessment of the issue. So what have we got here? Actually, um, Sean might need to go into a, a serious case review, uh, uh, into a, a strategic meeting around what we've got, but she might not. Um, but where are we having that conversation and making that decision? The risk is if we don't trigger them into the official process we present risk to ourselves and it's all very well for senior people to say oh we should be acting differently but are they the ones with their feet to the fire when it starts to go wrong when the decision which was made in the best intentions goes wrong and somebody dies or ends up in prison or wherever it might be um, so uh, you know I talked about this earlier uh, in the room but uh, you know I had this conversation with, with a lot of my senior people some time ago and said, I want you to act differently. I want you to act outside of policy, provided what you're doing is legal and you've thought it through and you've justified it and it's proportionate. I want you to act outside of policy. It was very difficult to get people to do that. And in the end, and this sounds very bizarre, but I had to write a policy to say you can break the policy. And you know, that, that's just the culture that we're in, but it gave people some safeguard to say, look, this is written down by the head of the organization. Now, now, that's not saying that if you're dealing with something like a domestic violence incident, you should act outside of policy. I'm not saying that at all. You should think very, very hard about your decision making. But if you can justify it, it's proportionate and it's legal to do it. And it's in the interest of those people. Why wouldn't we be doing it? Well, we don't because we just follow the rules okay. and the rules can suffocate us. Okay. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you for the answer to that one. Alison, one for mm. you, Kelly, if I may. Are some ACE risk factors more important than others in predicting outcomes? If so, would this help us to focus resources? Mm. Good question. Interesting question, that mm. one. Mm. I think um, when we start to uh, think about the life course impact of ACEs, um, we need to think right back at the beginning and what we what's really going on here. We know that it's multiple ACEs which are causing or have a risk of causing um, the uh, neurological uh, behavioural impacts that we've been talking about today. Yeah. So it's about the collective impact of, um, in the sense, you know, looking at the life course, a child as they're growing up being faced by repeated stress on their body, feeling scared all the time, feeling afraid, um, uh, Called toxic stress. If you want to know more about it, there's some brilliant clips on the um, Harvard uh, Center of the Developing Child site, which explain it all okay. really well. We'll give that a name check in the Harvard. 
Children's Centre on the Developing Child. Uh, there's loads down there. Those are really short and snappy ones well, that uh, uh, help explain um, in a really pictorial way okay. what's going on. So it's 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 not to say one adverse experience doesn't have an impact. Okay. Yeah, it does. But it, what we're talking here are multiple ACEs having impact over the life course. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious of time, folks, and I know we've had several questions in about families first. Just to give you the heads up, Charlotte, I'll be coming back to you on that one. But we need to move on to scenario three now. So Sean's 17 now. She's left school by the age of 14, but managed to gain qualifications in mechanics, bricklaying, mm -hmm. health and safety, and alternative education setting. She lives in supported housing accommodation for young people and has a large group of friends she's spending time with. Many of the friends have been in trouble with the police for stealing cars and possession of drugs. Sean doesn't see her mother often and they used to fight and Sean dislikes Joe's partner, Simon. Sean's been prescribed antidepressants by GP but she doesn't always take them and she doesn't like how they make her feel. Sean is smoking cannabis and she feels this helps her relax and cope. When she's with her friends, Sean feels like she belongs. She can have fun. Sean is in a relationship with a 30-year-old man, Tom, and they move in together. Sean feels cared for and he buys her things she needs and goes everywhere with her. Sean has a baby boy, Matt, when she's 18 years old. Sean's depression gets worse and the relationship with Tom deteriorates and they often argue and fight. Sean wants their relationship to work and be a proper family. Money becomes a problem and Tom starts selling things from the home and running up debt. Tom is spending more and more time away from home and Sean finds out he's now using heroin. Sean loves Matt. She doesn't want him to go through the same thing she did, so she tries to split up from Tom. Tom is eventually arrested and remanded in prison on drugs-related charges. Probably a good time to come over to you um, and at the end of that final sentence. If that's all right, Jeff, does get to kick off. Yeah, um, it, interesting, isn't it? Because the, the, those people that I was arresting in the early 80s, uh, my colleagues are now arresting their children and their grandchildren. Um, and I could have said at the time, when they have children, they'll be committing crime and they'll be in a chaotic lifestyle and their children's children will, and guess what? They are. And we don't break the cycle. So <coughs> we know it's coming. And so what we've got here now is Sean doing her best, but Matt's issue isn't it you know Matt is now going to be the next generation yeah. of Sean yeah. and it's a and it's a never-ended cycle um I think the reality is Tom if he's dealing heroin it's against the law and um, the law hasn't changed on that he's going to get arrested he's going to get imprisoned I don't think that's the, ever going to the solution no. um because you know again that's the vicious cycle but we've got to a stage in in his cycle where it needs an intervention you know he's dealing drugs and heroin um so I think this is the, the vicious circle just going round the next yes. stage. And at, w without the interventions that Charles talked about at the right time, mm -hmm. we just go around the cycle again and again, and we just keep dealing with the same things. Mm -hmm. We will always get some of these crises. Yeah. We will always get some people who, who will be lawless. That's, that's inevitable. We'll have to deal with that. But I think we can reduce the demand on our services if we intervene at an earlier stage. And I think it's, a, it's the right thing to do. OK, thank you. Alison? So Matt is the new Sean, sadly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what we're also seeing in that scenario is some of those life course behaviours um, starting to play out. And I think um, so. There's quite a bit, quite a bit in here. Um, there's quite a bit around how do you, how do services work together um, to share that information. Uh, we've also got things we know, like uh, particularly the age three, because mm -hmm. um, we see lots of activity happening. Um, really early on, then we start to see some stuff happening as children go to school. Yeah. There's the bit in the middle. Uh, we know that we've got flying start in, way, in yeah. parts of Wales um, where there's intensive health visiting who potentially would be starting to, um, they probably already know a lot of this, but he, there would be a lot happening there. But what about outside of those areas? How are systems working together mm -hmm. um, to support families which are high risk? Uh, there's some new tools being introduced. Um, do these go far enough? I think is a question. Um, there's also that myth around ACEs, um, which, um, and, and it's a bit here with Matt being so young, about just because children don't understand it, they don't feel the impact, <coughs> and that is a myth. Right, um, okay. We know that that impact begins in the womb, um, potentially, for mothers that are, are, are experiencing a lot of trauma. Um, 
traumatic experiences themselves yeah. and then at that early, very early age once the child is born so you know we need to think about that and we need to think about how we share some of that with parents okay. um prisons i think there's some really good examples yeah. again yeah. of um going back to that point of family and um you know how children draw on their families some great examples of work in wales uh, where children are working quite closely with dads okay. um, in particular and um, bernardo's i think are doing quite a lot of yes. work around that um, so we can dig out some information on that okay. and, and share that too. Okay. Um, I'll just stop talking now. Can we pick that up? I know Bernardo's are listening in. If they'd like to send us the link and we'll share it with everybody. Is that the one that's happening in, in Bridgend? In, yeah. yeah in Bridgend. Can we pick that up? It's Bernardo's are doing work with fathers in prisons in Park. Uh, Pay Park and I think maybe HMP Bedouin. Okay, I'm Bedouin. Yeah, okay, um, well, yeah. And Team Round, you know, you mentioned Team Round the Families earlier on. Oh, yeah. um, you, you know, they've got a role in this sort yeah. of how you bring in support to support the family okay. space, I think. Before I come to you, Charlotte, just to let you know, there's a lot of traffic about families first being shared, about being successful across Wales, linking services and sectors. They talked about tapping schools, multi agencies, yeah, and um, taking yeah. them by sort of. What are they saying here? Are we talk, uh, taking, uh, referring to them by silos so much? Oh, right, okay. Um, let's get some examples then. What's happening out there in terms of families first? You can demonstrate. Do you want to share with us? And then we'll share it with everyone listening in, if that's okay. I think on, just on that point about, you know, we have talked about silos. Uh, we, you know, there's no getting away from it. Some of the things we've talked around with data sharing, um, boundaries mm -hmm. that are put in place by organizations by leaders by policy but i think uh, and this is one thing when i mentioned right at the very start we've got some really strong building blocks in yeah. here there are some great examples of multi-agency okay. working okay. across wales yeah. and i think what we need to do is think about are there ways we can strengthen them even further okay and you know you were talking about at the very start having a core on building out from you know where can we be doing a bit more of that? I'd like, like to ask, strength for yeah, us, I think. I'd like to ask the delegates, if you're if you're working with or know about the families first and there's some successful projects, please they email us in with mm -hmm. your contact details and we'll happily share it wider for that sort of mm -hmm. So Charlotte. Okay. So um, we I said to Alison that um, Matt is the new Sean. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get to Matt, if you like, okay. I'd like to talk about where Sean's in supported accommodation okay. and how the, again golden opportunity for housing supported accommodation providers to be doing something that changes Sean's life trajectory. So if that supported accommodation is a psychologically informed environment, it's trauma informed, it understands where Sha what Sean's been through. So it would be asset based, the strengths that she brings, I've talked about that. Mm. She in spite of what's happened to her, she's got sparks, something about her, she's got she's on this course, she she's wants to be a mechanic. That should be picked up and built as the resilience. The way out of this for Sean is employment and ambition. But a psychologically informed environment, so if they had an understanding of her attachment issues and difficulties, they would be able to spot her neediness with, the, with Tom. And if they were flexible in their approach to, so if this wasn't a single person service that only deals with Sean, if this was a think family, okay, so Tom's in her life, we need to allow Tom into this scheme. We need to be working with Tom. We need to be having a relationship with Tom too. I've seen it happen, and I know it works, that Tom's life trajectory, suddenly he's nurtured by a scheme that actually gives about him and cares about him. So there's a massive opportunity there for changing the life trajectory. If that's not going to happen, and we know one of the, um, the impacts of ACEs is early pregnancy, so likely she's going to get pregnant. And I, again, I've seen it happen in so many schemes. What then can happen is, oh right, so now suddenly, Sean is no longer the person who needs the help, it's all about the baby. So Sean shifts from person who we need to support, we understand she's been traumatized, she needs an attachment approach, she needs trauma-informed services, to now she's gonna be a mother, we need to assess her, we need to know whether she's capable of doing this, this is all about the baby. And it shifts from her being persecuted, sorry, yeah. for what's happened to her, yeah. and suddenly she's been expected to comply with um, ways to behave and, th and, and processes that she doesn't understand when because really she's still a child in arrested development herself and needs nurturing. So those services just don't exist. She goes off that cliff and she's on a different trajectory with Matt and she's very much alone and isolated mm. in that. I know we've got a number of mentors listening in this morning, sorry this afternoon, 
do you want to share some of your experiences and thoughts so we can share wider, if that's okay? Mm -hmm. Families First, we've obviously okay. lit uh, something about this. Families First has been really successful across Wales, thinking yeah. services and sectors. Well, what, what, would you, what would you say to that? I would agree. I think, you know, um, I'm, I don't hope we haven't given the impression that we think Families First is a silo. I think absolutely the culture of Families First is what we want to be promoting okay. more widely. Um, I still think, though, it has a little bit of a, it's for those people over there, where I think what we're talking about is it has to be not just for that group of, you know, vulnerable people. We, ACES affects all of us. Okay. And, and, and so I suppose that's the point, is the cultural shift from the, the way that families first approach things needs to be how everybody approaches okay. things. Okay, yeah. that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got a number of questions about funding. So we, we've triggered off the, that, the, the F word. Okay. You know, I'm amazed that we've got to this time that we've, we haven't got to, to it. So um, I'm going to use this question, if I may, to ask about it. Do you agree that the funding flexibility and early years offer initiatives are the drivers needed to force change? And there's a very short answer. There is it, a short answer, answer to that. But there's a, I, I'm interested in the longer one in terms of... Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before I answer that, one thing that um, just uh, left my mind when Charlotte was talking was an example we heard of recently of... Um, just a different approach in a school in Bridgend yeah. and actually it links to funding because uh, there was a secondary school there that had employed a school nurse um, that was based in that school yeah. and was there to be able to, for somebody for pupils to go to yeah. okay she dealt with the medical yeah. issues okay. um, uh, what we've found from some of the information that we've heard about it is actually just by dealing with some of the medical issues she's found out a whole load of information about um, a pupil, you know, that they were caring for, for a parent, oh. and they were being looked after by a grandparent, and then that's why certain things were starting to happen okay. in school. Um, but also, as somebody that um, pupils could go to, we know that there are high numbers of teenage pregnancy in Bridgend, okay. um, and what fantastic opportunity potentially for that school nurse. Yeah. So this is about, you know, when we were talking about boundaries earlier, and we're talking about thinking about roles great example of um, yeah. a local authority that has taken a different approach, tried it in, in one yeah. school, um, it needs to be formally evaluated, that there's lots of different impacts that are starting. Yeah. So I just share that, it is related to funding because they made a decision. Before you answer the original question, I am aware there's a number of people of you out there in education, just wondering if you, are you adopting any different approaches like the school in Bajen having a nurse? Anything else you'd want to share that we could share wider with the, with the people listening in this morning? So, this afternoon. so let me go back to that question again. So do you agree that the funding flexibility and early years offer initiatives are the drivers needed to force change? I think they're enablers of change Ooh, okay. um, rather than drivers okay. of force change per se okay. um, is what I would say and I think going back to that point about bravery earlier and some of the points around <coughs> um, Thinking, thinking in an integrated systems way. Okay. This will be a bit of a, you know, proof of the pudding is in the eating. Okay. I think it would be quite easy to just go, oh yes, well we've got this potential for flexibility. Um, you know, everybody, everybody is doing some great work. Okay. How do you prioritise? Okay. The answer I think will be in thinking about a lot of the things we've talked about today. How do you do things a bit differently? Uh, how do you use some of this to break outside the boundaries where we have got geographical boundaries? Okay, yeah. um, how do you use this to think about communities in a different way, okay. um, more more broadly? Um, so I think for me it's more of an enabler okay. um, potentially, but I think it's great to see because I know from my own experience when I've gone around and talked to people where we put a lot of boundaries in place around programmes, mm -hmm. we uh, performance manage them to death, Yeah, is my own personal view. Um, <clears throat> and quite often, some of those performance managers manage uh, measures, and I think you touched on it, Jeff, drive the wrong behaviours. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a great yeah. opportunity yeah. to to use this to drive the right sort of behaviours that yeah. we want, okay. and not create reverse mm -hmm. systems. Okay. Um, you know, some people are really pragmatic about it, um, uh, but I think it's, it's an opportunity. Okay, Jeff, you're nodding like mad. There, we <laughs> had a conversation about performance management earlier. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts about as a leader? What do you be saying to uh, to people listening in this afternoon in terms of adding on to comments that Alison's made? Well, you know, I'd eventually before I'm in the middle of a doctorate at the moment looking at collective performance assessment. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do we 
do that collectively, not in our silos. Yeah. And we don't. Um, but, you know, so, some of the points about, I don't think we've got a choice here, really. I don't think we've got a choice. It, it's, it's taking its time, but the public are more informed, mm -hmm. so they expect more. Mm -hmm. Demand's increasing. Resources are hugely diminished um, through austerity. You know, so for the, the, the police force I was in, I took £60 million pounds out of a budget of £130 million. You know, so that's the wow. size of the cuts we're talking about. Yeah, I put £2 million pounds to pump prime, a collective hub of working together. Um, now, it wasn't the money. Mm. It was actually getting people across the table to agree that this was a different approach. We couldn't park everything else we were doing, yeah. but to start doing things in a different <coughs> way. That's the mindset change that has to take place. And it isn't easy for the reason I talked about the accountability earlier. Mm. There's so many people hold you to account in so many ways. But I think Alison's absolutely right. Many of our performance indicators, which came from new public management in the 90s, yeah. are bean counting, driven by numbers and targets, okay. and they're not about people. Okay. Um, so that's why I said our performance indicators, you can base them around intermediate outcomes, not necessarily final outcomes, because okay. they take some time. Yeah. Yeah. But how have we got intermediate outcomes, which are the journey? Okay. And so are they now attending school? Are they pulling less public services? You, you, you can then describe that. I think the problem we've always struggled with on this, on early intervention, is I intervene, they no longer pull public services, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. how do I know that wouldn't have happened anyway? Yeah, yeah. And, and Well, of course we know it wouldn't have happened anyway, but how do you prove it? Yeah. And it goes back to the point I made at the very start, which is everybody's looking for proof about what we're talking about here working, and it will take generations. Okay. And, and some of the intermediate stuff is there for us to see now. It really okay. is. That's, that point about intermediate is really important. I'm conscious of time, folks, so I'm going to move on to the fourth and final scenario. So Matt now is three years old. He lives with his mother, Sean. He hasn't seen his father, Tom, since he was two years old. Matt and Sean were at a home where Tom was arrested on drugs-related charges. Tom now is in prison, and Sean has no contact with him. Sean spends more time with her mother, Jo, for support. Jo's mental health is still a concern. Sean tries to help her mother, keeping her home clean and shopping for her. Social services are concerned that Sean is leaving Jo to look after Matt on her own. When Sean returns home, she usually has friends to stay. This happens more often and there are concerns how she's caring for Matt. During one party, Sean is arrested for possession of amphetamines. Matt is in bed at that time and Sean rings her auntie to come stay at hers to look after Matt. Sean is offered a diversionary intervention instead of prosecution. Sean suffers with anxiety and depression. She finds it difficult to leave home on her own. The health visitor is worried how this impacts on Matt's opportunities to mix with other children. Matt is quiet when he's around new people and very clingy, clingy with his mum. When Sean's having a good day, she likes to take Matt to the park and go on dog walks. Matt enjoys spending this time with his man. So, that's the fourth and final scenario. What would your observations be to that, Jeff? Well, there's no panacea to, to everything, is there? You know, mm -hmm. people will all have, there will always be complex lifestyles. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, we should not try and push a service that breaks the cycle on everybody, because actually, if they don't want to engage in it, it's really difficult to get engaged. Mm -hmm. And there will be people like that. But there's huge amounts of people, like Charlotte said, who might be in um, better breakfast accommodation where we've got the opportunity and we can reach out and we can change the, the cycle. What we, we're describing here is a cycle will continue for generations mm -hmm. unless something happens at some stage intervening. And it won't be the answer for all, for more. No. Um, <coughs> you know, you're never going to have the panacea for all of them, but you might for one or two, particularly the younger people. And there's our chance uh, okay. to do things differently and there's your generational change. Hearing what your as panel members have been sharing this afternoon, it's definitely not a one size fits no, all. No, you no. are literally you are you it's around the person and the needs of the individual. I'm hearing a very clear message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alison, what would your thoughts be? Um, <coughs> I think going back again to what we we're talking about, um, needing to to see beyond the symptoms. There is a place for addressing symptoms, but we need to get underneath. And, look and understand what are the causes um, that are driving some of those symptoms and then thinking about how we might treat them. Um, we've talked a bit about um, social prescribing um, and it will be one of the questions which comes up quite often is how do people know what services are out there? 
Yeah, and I was at a great event a couple of weeks ago in Blaine Gwent, um, and I was sitting on a table of social workers, and it was a bit like speed dating with local people and um, organisations talking about a lot of the services they had. Um, there was one, I think it was called Gwent Connect, where you just connect through into lots of different yeah. services that are there to support people. Um, and I'm aware of, um, and I need to find out a bit more about it, something from Welsh Government, which uh, has come through the Health Channel, building a directory of services. Okay. Um, there's another organisation out there, I think, um, uh, around youth and wellbeing, which is Collect. So mm. it's how do we support professionals in um, knowing what support is there, where support okay. is needed. So we've talked quite a lot <coughs> today about the whole system, getting ahead of the process, um, processes we've got, um, integrating across systems. But sometimes people just need to know um, as professionals yeah. what's out there. So at the beginning we talked about um, a, a world where Sean would know what's out there, but we've got got, got the other angle we need to think okay. about as well. I think it'd be really appropriate for us to ask. I kn I'm, a bit, I'm aware a number of sort of Gwent Connects kind of voluntary bodies and charities are listening in. Do you want to tweet us uh, against the hashtag um, WAO underscore ACES and give yourself a name check about what you're doing? Let's share this as wide as possible. That'd be really helpful. I've heard some really good things about Gwent Connect. So yeah, but I'm sure there's lots of others out there. So come on, give us a name check. And I'm aware that there's one particularly in education as well for. Um, post 16 uh, as well as as for schools why not tweet us and share and we'll tweet, we'll tweet it out as wide as we possibly can thank you so charlotte um <clears throat> yeah three points really one is about it's never too late mm. so not engaging mm. is engaging mm. not engaging is communicating i don't trust this system i don't trust you you need to reflect and think about how you do things differently <coughs> for me it's never we need to think about when somebody's not engaging, whose needs are we meeting with our system, actually. The other bit then is about training. So if this is about training work, work, the workforce to understand what trauma-informed approach is, to understand by somebody not communicating with me, actually they're communicating, that will not work alone if we don't have the leadership piece that Jeff talks about yeah. and the cultural shift. You can't just satellite skills training in or interventions in without the cultural shift and the willingness to do things differently mm. within the back covering culture that we talked about. And the third point that has been made today is I just want to make the point having feeling like I know this person mm. and being there myself as a practitioner mm. is that that toll that that takes on our workforce mm. working yeah, in these services. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are relentlessly working with this kind of hopelessness, the impact that that has on that culture mm. is actually, I'll just follow the process because I know that trying to do things differently is too hard and I don't get the reward. And that actually, if we don't invest in our staff and caring for them properly and enabling them to do this difficult work without blame, you know, and realising the toll that that takes, then what you get is a high turnover of staff, which then, the serving, you know, any skills and great culture to put in there goes anyway. Yeah, and which okay. makes business sense too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to read um, one email I've had through and just want to share what's been happening in Bridgend. Um, it's from Mark who said, the school in Bridgend is the tough in schools approach, which is in over 60 schools across Swansea. We use different people in different schools depending on the resources and need. We have evaluated the TAF in schools and have evidence showing schools attendance has improved. Mm. Some of our TAF in schools work, including the TAs, that's, a t that's the teacher's assistant then, isn't it? Lunchtime staff, PSEs, I don't know what PSEs are. Isn't that the personal and social education? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, okay, all of which we have upskilled to engage and help identify families that need support earlier. Great. Thanks for sharing that. We really appreciate that. We've got. We'll have any more, as many stories like that as possible. As long as you're happy for us to share as wide as possible with the delegates who are listening in. Um, I also heard a lovely example from Bridget where the police have been trained in ACE awareness and okay. self housing, where a police officer phoned the landlord and okay. said, "I see ACEs in this family. Do you know anything about ACEs?" And the landlord said, "Actually, yes, I do. <laughs> what are we going to do?" And a piece of work went in between police and housing in Bridget okay. because of that. And that's a huge step forward. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That would never have happened. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's South Wales Police. Yeah. Um, in Bridget, part of the Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. So we're coming towards the end of our 90 minutes, folks, and um, I'm aware there's a few more questions coming in, but it would be rude for me not to ask you just one more question in terms of if there was one key message 
you'd want to give delegates about sort of ACEs and what we've talked about this morning, what would that be? Because there's a lot of information and sharing, but if there was one thing, Jeff, if I kick off with you, what would be the one key message you'd want to? I think we like to make things simple and put them in boxes. The reality is, as we all know, public services is much more complex than that. Um, and the, the one thing I would ask is that people join public services in the main for one reason, yeah. that's to help people, and particularly our most vulnerable people. And please just remember that in the interventions, even when you feel like everything's on top of you. Really important. Great, great, great response. Thanks, Jeff. Alison, can I come to you? Um, I think for me, this is thinking about um, how we use our knowledge and information around ACEs to inform what and how we do things. This is not about ACEs becoming another thing. Um, and, and I want to stress that more. If it becomes another thing, in my view, we failed. Um, this is everybody's business, and uh, we need to use what we know to revolutionise our approach. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks very much. Charlotte, last but not least. Yeah, just echo that really. Be creative. This isn't, we don't have the answers. This is about prescribing answers. It's about being creative and knowing the needs of the people that you are serving and then really scrutinizing that point about non engagement is engagement. If we're not, if they're not communicating, if they're not connecting with you, have a look at what you're doing and how ACE informed that is and talk to each other about ACEs. Talk to your friends, your families, your neighbours, yeah. everybody. Okay, <laughs> lovely, thank you. Nice one, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it's about. Keep talking yeah. in some ways. So, folks, it's over to you now. This is the starting point that the good practice team are sort of in terms of sharing the uh, ACEs and raising awareness. My question to you is, what can we do next? We need to know from you where you'd like us to, what information you'd like us to share, who would you like to speak to, what you want to know. Tell us. And we'll do our level best to share through webinars, through seminars when it's appropriate. So, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to the panel because without you, lovely folks, this wouldn't happen. So, thank you very much, all. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Nina. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Team behind there, they've been working jolly hard. Thank you very much, Sarah Gifto, Michelle. So, finally, thanks to you. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for some great questions coming in. But don't mm -hmm. leave it there. If they've got some observations, and ideas you want to share or what's happening, please share with us. Mm -hmm. As long as you're happy that we will share with everyone who's, who's on the attendance list today, we will share with you. I'm signing off now, but don't forget, please let us know where you want us to go next. On behalf of the Good Practice Team, the Wales Audit Office, thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>